Hello there. Today we're going down memory lane with our Movie Almanac, a series we've been doing over the past year with Alijan Pamir. We begin in the 1970s with the 50th anniversary of Cabaret. It's a great way to start our special, as the film is a big reason musicals made a comeback in Hollywood. This was Germany in the early 30s. 1972's Cabaret is not your typical musical. It doesn't have cotton candy colored cinematography, and there are no overly happy musical numbers. What we do have is dark lighting and drama. It's a fitting style for the film, since the story is set while Weimar Germany was in political turmoil. It follows dancer Sally Bowles. She lives in Berlin at a time when the Nazis were on the rise. This period picture helped musicals make a comeback in the 1970s. It really Roger Ebert praised Cabaret for defying the genre's clichés. Reviews at the time called its bleak approach refreshing and wrote that quality added to its triumph. Critic David Benedict elaborated that it was made for people who didn't like musicals. It was not shot in that typical style. Tackling topics like corruption and Nazism was not common for the genre either. But after Cabaret, uncommon subjects and approaches in musicals became a thing. One example is 1975's Tommy. It isn't based on a stage production, but on an album by The Who. Critic Charles Champlin believes the screen adaptation to be an astonishing achievement. What you this summer, Sandy? 1978's Grease, on the other hand, provided nostalgia for the masses with its 1950s setting. But according to Vincent Camby, while doing it, the flick also brought wit and imagination to the musical. And collectively, these features not only revived an old genre, but brought a new sensibility to it as well. And that makes Cabaret and its peers important to the evolution of the musical, which no longer was notorious for being old-fashioned. Let's switch gears and take a look at the vamp that started it all, Nosferatu. The movie turned 100 years old and we had this look at its enduring legacy. 1922's Nosferatu tells the story of blood-sucking vampire Count Orlok. After leaving his home in Transylvania, he takes up residence in Germany, bringing death along with him. The film is an unofficial adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, and it's considered the first vampire story ever told on screen. After its release, the film was a hit in its homeland of Germany. But aside from the scary makeup, there was likely another reason. It left an impression on German audiences. That's because Germany came out on the losing side of World War I a few years earlier, and the Allies had imposed harsh reparations for the country's role in the war. It was a move that caused massive financial and social upheaval, and created fear and distrust among a traumatized citizenship. Critics argue that Nosferatu became the celluloid manifestation of the German public's frustration with life in post-war Germany. Even the film's producer and designer, Alban Grau, is quoted as saying that the deaths in Nosferatu were inspired 
by the casualties of war. This classic horror movie is part of the expressionist film wave that was popular in Germany at the time. The movement's credo was described as, quote, extreme distortion of reality in order to express inner emotion. This explains the spooky appearance of Count Orlok, with his spiked ears, drawn face, his talon-shaped fingers, and sharp fangs. In essence, he stands in for the outsider that threatens German stability. But despite the film's allegorical nature, today it's remembered best for its contribution to vampire lore. But for a movie that has deep ties to war trauma, it's a scary coincidence that Nosferatu's centenary arrives at a time when the world is once again mired in armed conflict between nations. It's been 50 years since The Godfather was first unleashed on audiences and, to this day, it's still considered one of the greatest and most influential movies ever made. And a good share of its success lies in the vision of its director. With its artistic film style and high production values, The Godfather did something no film before it could. It gave credibility to a gangster flick. Are you driving yourself, boss? Yes. Not only did it become the highest grossing movie of 1972, but it turns its director, Francis Ford Coppola, into an A-list Hollywood player. But Coppola wasn't the studio's first choice for the job. Paramount Pictures had wanted old Hollywood filmmaker Elia Kazan. He directed Marlon Brando to Oscar glory with On the Waterfront. But Kazan declined the offer. But Mama, it's a sin, isn't it? Unless the studio then sought out new Hollywood auteur Peter Bogdanovich. But as a director, famous for making romantic dramas, he wasn't interested either. Just tell me what's wrong, honey. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm your father. Shh, Lou, it is so I know it's, it's all right if I talk in my own house. Lou. The executives finally reigned in Coppola. Although he didn't have any hits to his name, he was of Italian heritage and considered a promising artist. Coppola was so unimpressed by the Godfather novel, written by Mario Puzo, that he also said no to Paramount. But at the time, his production company, Zoetrope, was in financial distress. And it was a need for cash that prompted Coppola to barter a fee to his liking. In addition to that, he also managed to negotiate, making The Godfather on his own terms, including stylistic authorship and tackling the subject. So it was a critique of modern capitalism and not just a mob story. After that was agreed to, the director went to town. Coppola wanted The Godfather to be a unique experience for audiences. So he brought together a wide range of film styles when making it. He borrowed the conflict-ridden relationship dynamics from Federico Fellini for the film's characters. <laughs> And he mimicked Akira Kurosawa's use of symbolism. <laughs> Cinematographer Gordon Willis, who had already explored a similar style with acclaimed thriller Clute, was recruited to realize the film's dark, noirish atmosphere. I can't identify him as anybody. I'm singing in the rain. The director even reached back to old MGM musicals, 
in order to recreate a kind of vintage Hollywood elegance. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above And the sun's in my heart and I'm ready for love Hollywood Big Shot's gonna give you what you want. He says there's no chance. Brando and Al Pacino provided the star power, but Coppola still had doubts whether or not his vision for the film would click with audiences. I'll never take sides with anyone against the family again, ever. I was so down in the dumps and and uh, and uh, unsure of myself, and 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 and, and the, they, no one liked the picture originally. You know who? There was one person who saw it, and it was the first person who gave me uh, encouragement. It was the wonderful writer Bob Town, and he saw it, and he said, "You know what, Francis Marlin is great in the movie, and the movie is great." And and before he said that, no one had ever told me that. Let's set the meeting. It turns out, screenwriter Town was right. The film was a hit. And according to Coppola, its success was due to several different factors. Some place where there's people, so I feel safe. I think it's the combination of the audience being ready for that kind of movie, a wonderful cast, great artists like the photographer, the production designer, the music, it's just all the things lined up. Fifty years later, the film is still held in the same high regard. And even Coppola, to this day, makes movies his own way ever since. The Godfather stands as his most influential and successful outing. Let's move on to 1962. French New Wave spent a lot of time exploring men's feelings and their ideals about women. Then a movie came along that broke the mold with a loud and proud female voice. Cleo from 5 to 7 is the story of a glamorous singer who's waiting to see if she has cancer. Through a voiceover, Cleo talks directly to the viewer and opens up about a life lived under the gaze of men. She laments about being judged on her looks and adds that she's worn out from the constant stares and standards by the opposite sex. Critics say couching these concerns in such a self-conscious manner is what makes the movie stand out, even radical. Other feminist issues are also addressed, like Cleo's sickness not being taken seriously. Men in the movie say her worries are merely an attempt to seek attention, while millions of women in the world, either today or in 1962, would find Cleo's situation relatable, the camera also comes to the character's aid. Much of the movie is shot from Cleo's vantage point, and reviews say this perspective allows the audience to further identify with her distress. By the end of Cleo's exhausting wait, she meets a soldier on leave from the Algerian war. He says the French are dying for nothing over there, and his words give Cleo the final realization that men are responsible for an oppression that can have fatal consequences. She concludes that trying to live according to their standards is no way to go through the only life she has. And as the clock strikes seven, the doctor hands back her test results, and she declares she's no longer afraid. So to a, so to a. Sixty years ago, comedy director Blake Edwards switched lanes and released the groundbreaking thriller Experiment in Terror. And Ali John explains how he revived old Hollywood along the way. Miss Sherwood, you have a phone call, a police lieutenant. Experiment in Terror 
tells the story of a bank teller who must steal $100,000 or her sister will be killed. Despite being released in 1962, the movie's plot sounds like a golden age Hollywood thriller. That's because director Blake Edwards drew inspiration from Alfred Hitchcock and film noirs from the 1940s. Hello, Mr. Ripley. About that matter. Critics remark that Edwards brought intensity to thriller cinema. He accomplished this by filming the movie with long, tense sequences in unnerving settings, like a storage room full of mannequins. He's also credited for adding a whopping dose of suspense by putting his lead character in a long take and surrounding the frame with shadows. Emmanuel Levy calls the film a highlight of the genre, and Chris Wicking says it stands the test of time. Harrison Blackman adds that the film stylistically paved the way for the noirs of David Lynch, Ridley Scott, and Jonathan Demme. We'd be more comfortable in the house. And you could see what I looked like. I was something of an athlete, you know. Yes, yes. I was known as the Pavlova of the Parallels. But the yeah. truth of the matter is, experiment in terror is an oddity in Edwards' filmography, since he is more famous for his comedies. And those movies also work on the same logic, reaching back to an old Hollywood genre to push its foundations further. Well now, I expect you're all wondering why I asked you here. Edwards' Pink Panther franchise is a good example of this. But why was Edwards so hung up on yesteryear's cinema when making his own movies? Well, his step-grandfather was a silent film director, and his stepfather was a production manager on Golden Age Hollywood films. So Edwards wanted to recreate the feeling of such movies for a modern audience. Sean Levy of the Los Angeles Times believes those recreations are milestones in Hollywood history, and adds that the inspiring quality of those pictures makes everyone in today's comedies a descendant of Edwards. Forty years ago, E.T., the extraterrestrial, proved that young moviegoers were reliable customers at the multiplex. And that new market changed the whole viewing experience for everyone. Indiana Jones! Let her go. After his action epic, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, director Steven Spielberg wanted to make a more intimate, personal movie. Oh, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. And that project eventually became 1982's E.T., the story of a lonely kid who befriends an alien from outer space. The flick explored camaraderie among peers, as well as dysfunction within the family, all told through the eyes of children. And the result was a box office sensation. E.T. raked in more than $600 million. It also beat the likes of Star Wars to become the highest grossing film ever at the time. And since a kid's movie had become a blockbuster, studios began to take that kind of movie fare and its target audience seriously. Children's films soon became the king of the multiplex, with higher production values than before. They also included more action and adventure. Goonies never say die! Ah! Features the like the Goonies. We're the Monster Squad. The Monster Squad. Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. And young Sherlock Holmes ended up defining the 1980s as a golden age for kids' cinema. And that spirit is still alive in the 21st century.
Ever since you left, everything's been a total disaster. One prime example is Netflix's Stranger Things. It has a similar story based on friendship and not so dissimilar fantasy elements. It's also full of references to the 1980s, which is when the series is set. The acclaim garnered by the recent fourth season shows that people are still eager for that kind of entertainment. And the roots of it all go back to Spielberg's low-key movie from 40 years ago about a child's longing for friendship that ended up becoming a game-changing jaggernaut. For 25 years, the Ghostface Killers have been trying to off Sidney Prescott, and we looked at how over five films they've failed and failed and failed again in the franchise. Hello? It's happening. Three attacks so far. Do you have a gun? I'm Sidney Prescott, of course I have a gun. The town of Woodsboro is once again being terrorized by a series of murders. And of course, they have something to do with the Stab series, the movie franchise within the movie franchise, based on Sidney Prescott's life, battling masked killers. Whoever this is is going to keep coming for you. Hello, Sidney. Do you like scary movies? What's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big breasted girl who can't act. The original scream came out in the late 1990s. Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. Back then, horror films were failing to please audiences, and Scream turned the genre on its head to become a runaway hit. So forget the boyfriend, it's tired. Who else do we got? There's Mickey, the freaky Tarantino film student. But if he's a suspect, so am I. So let's move on. Well, let's not move on. Maybe you are a suspect. Well, if I'm a suspect, you're a suspect. The kids in Scream are smart when it comes to horror movies, because they've seen too many of them. And they don't shy away from critiquing the 1990s with ironic remarks. Hi, Gail Weathers, author of The Woodsboro Murders. Do you think the killer will strike again? We have no evidence that this is a serial killer. It's a classic case of life imitating art, imitating life. Are you suggesting that someone's trying to make a real life sequel? Do you think someone's trying to duplicate Woodsboro? It looks like it. I think you have a copycat on your hands, G. Stab two? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. No, wow. Come on. This self referential style became pioneering postmodernist cinema, or what the kids today call meta. Aliens. In following the movie's success, a good chunk of mass entertainment began to have a meta approach to its subject matter, with characters that spoke in the same cynical tone. There are very few movies, let alone franchises, that had this kind of effect on pop culture. Mr. Originality, how would you make it different? I'd let the geek get the girl. I've seen this movie before. Not this movie, Sydney. And Scream 5 aims to repeat it in 2022. This time, the commentary focuses on our technology-obsessed world and criticizes movie remakes, sequels, and reboots. The joke is, of course, that this is exactly Scream 5's formula. Well... But if you're looking for the spark from the original movie, look elsewhere. Yeah, no. Kevin Williamson didn't return as a screenwriter, and Wes Craven died in 2015. It may be why the London Evening Standard says Scream 5 lacks in plot or a heroine, and Slant Magazine believes the film is as repetitive as the reboot culture it criticizes. That's not to say this Scream doesn't have its fans. It does. But it's likely the screams that follow will not be as sharp, strong, or as loud as the first one. Hello, Sydney. It's an honor.
That's it for this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of arts and culture. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.